And now for the live event at the ICC Theatre in Sydney, Australia. Does having an afternoon sleep affect your quality of sleep at night? Um, great question. I can keep this one pretty brief. Um, we just recorded a six-episode series that will be aired later this year uh, with the one and only mighty Matt Walker, who wrote the marvelous book, Why We Sleep. And uh, we went into this topic in depth. The business of naps is the following. Keep them shorter than 90 minutes so you don't disrupt your nighttime sleep. Don't do them at all if it disrupts your nighttime sleep. So if you're somebody that, for whom even 10 minutes of napping disrupts your nighttime sleep, don't do that. If you're somebody who wakes up from naps feeling groggy, that's what's called sleep inertia. This is what gave rise to the ever-famous nappuccino of having some coffee and then taking a nap, or an espresso and then taking a nap. Again, I get obsessed with nomenclature. Why didn't they call it an espresso, espresso nap? I don't know. Naps are wonderful. If they're shorter than 90 minutes, don't interfere with nighttime sleep. But I, in particular, am a big fan of, as many of you know, this business of non-sleep deep rest, of putting the body into what? Body still, mind awake. And we know, based on several studies from the University of Copenhagen, that that actually replenishes levels of dopamine in certain key areas of the brain that restore mental and physical vigor and do not disrupt nighttime sleep, but rather enhance one's ability to fall and stay asleep or to fall back asleep. So not only are these states of body still, mind awake, very beneficial it seems, or I should say perhaps for creativity because that was all anic data, but we know from real data, from laboratory data on many subjects, peer reviewed, et cetera, that body still, mind alert, is actually an effective means to improve one's sleep and perhaps even make up for sleep that one has lost. So I encourage you, if you're a napper, great. And if you have challenges with sleep in any way that you think might be related to your napping activity, that you consider short 10 minute or maybe 20 minute non-sleep deep rest protocols. By the way, they're completely zero cost. And very soon we will be releasing to our YouTube Clips channel a 10 minute, 20 minute, and 30 minute non-sleep deep rest protocol that I've narrated. If you don't like my voice, we can. there are many out there of more pleasant voices. But um, what might be of particular interest to you is that the visual is of um, the beautiful sunrise uh, over Sydney. So, you know, it'll bring you home as well. Um, sunrise is here, absolutely spectacular. Do you believe in the placebo effect? Absolutely, and there's probably a joke there, but I can't come up with it on the fly. Um, how would I know if it's real? <laughs> um, something like that. Um, so the placebo effect is real. Um, our belief about what we've taken or what is happening to us has a powerful effect on our physiology. It's not purely psychological. The whole business of psychosomatic, even that word is starting to fall away as we start to understand that our beliefs have a powerful effect on what happens to us physiologically. So much so that, for instance, my colleague Ali Crum, a tenured professor at Stanford's Department of Psychology who's been a guest on the podcast who studies mindsets, has done beautiful experiments on stress, showing that if you watch a short video about stress and you learn all the terrible things that stress can do to your cognition, your sleep, and your well-being, well, that indeed that happens. And that if you watch a short video about how stress can be performance enhancing by sharpening your mental acuity, your access to particular memory stores, etc., that indeed that happens so-called belief effects. Why belief effects, not placebo effects? Well, placebo effects tend to be more general. Belief effects tend to be around specific types of information. But the placebo effect has recently been shown to extend to a dose-dependent placebo effect. One of the more remarkable papers, I think, published in the last few years, most people are unaware of. I talked about this in a Journal Club episode of the Human Lab podcast with the one and only Peter Atia described a paper where people took either zero, I believe it was 0.25 milligrams, half a milligram or a gram of nicotine, which is known to be a cognitive enhancer. Please don't smoke, dip, huff or snuff nicotine that's cancerous. 
in those forms, but, and taking nicotine can increase blood pressure, vasoconstriction, et cetera, but nicotine is a cognitive enhancer. It is a cognitive enhancer. And I can't help but tell you one story about this before I get back to placebo effect. Don't worry, I always make my way back. You can see why living with me as a child was so challenging. Um, nicotine, I was told by a very, very famous Nobel laureate member of the neuroscience community, because I visited his office, I won't tell you who it is, at Columbia University, I met with him, and he was telling me about what he studies, but I noticed he chewed no fewer than six pieces of Nicorette during the course of that conversation, and I had to just stop him at one point and say, why are you consuming all this nicotine? And he said, well, it's what's going to allow me to stave off Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, of course, and I don't want to smoke. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, there's some evidence that keeping levels of neuromodulators like dopamine and acetylcholine elevated despite the increases in blood pressure that are caused by consuming nicotine may indeed offset Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. I'm not telling you this as a clinical trial. I'm telling you this as anecdata. He is a Nobel Prize winner. He's still very, very sharp in his 80s. The point here is that in a study of nicotine and cognition, where people's cognition is indeed enhanced by nicotine, everybody knows that and agrees upon that, people who were told they had a higher dose of nicotine performed better in this cognitive task when in fact they consumed zero. And people who performed moderately, who were then told that they had consumed a higher dose of nicotine performed better than those that simply consumed the moderate dose and were told they had a moderate dose. In other words, everyone gets the same dose, either zero or moderate, but depending on what you're told, your performance changes accordingly. And that's cool, but what's really cool about the study is they actually recorded from brain centers of these individuals and the levels of activity in particular areas of the brain that are relevant for cognition changed according to what the people believe. So there you go placebo effect is changing neural activity. It's not all just through what you think is happening. What you think is happening is the reflection of neural activity, and then you go, well, of course. But I think it's an important study. So I believe in the placebo effect, and it is dose-dependent, and that raises all sorts of scary concerns about the placebo effect, but it's also pretty darn cool, because what it means is that our belief system including our understanding of the mechanisms that are likely driving certain effects of drugs or protocols or what have you, is going to play a powerful role in whether or not we get the effect that we want. And perhaps that's the most important thing, provided that you're going about it safely. How do I enter the rest and digest state and exit my constant fight or flight state? Well, the fastest way is gonna be physiological size, probably repeated two or three times in a row if you don't experience that the first time. The second would be to combine that with panoramic vision. I must say, and I don't want to sound like a, like a repeating record here, but there are certain things that if we're not doing on a regular basis, our nervous system is just going to idle at a higher, let's just call it autonomic RPM, which is not, you know, re real science language. But if you've ever felt, you know, wired and tired from lack of sleep, you know what this is about. The key thing is to get enough sleep each night. You know, it, so much so that I think we can safely say that stress is not bad for us provided you sleep well at night. Now the challenge is for most people, including myself, if you stress a lot, sleep doesn't come easily or you wake from sleep in the middle of the night. And here again is where zero cost behavioral protocols are truly, in my opinion, unless there's some dire clinical need, the most effective and best practice. And this non-sleep deep rest, which by the way, is indeed a renaming or a partial renaming of Yoga Nidra, which stands for yoga sleep. And again, I have tremendous reverence for the yogic traditions. It's just that I had to make a decision a few years ago when I'd been introduced to Yoga Nidra in 2015. I was down at a trauma treatment center and addiction treatment center in Florida run by a friend of mine, essentially observing what they were doing with these addicts that couldn't recover no matter what their effort, and they were able to recover, to get sober and stay sober, and people were getting over other sorts of traumas through the use of 
many protocols, of course, talk therapy, et cetera, but they would start their day with 30 minutes to an hour of yoga nidra. And I thought, what's yoga nidra? I learned it's yoga sleep. You lie down, you do a self-directed relaxation. It also involves intentions, et cetera. And I thought, this is really powerful. And I spent a lot of time in my laboratory working on it and understanding it. And there are other studies as well that now explain how these states of keeping the mind active while the body is still as a self-directed practice is immensely powerful for a number of reasons. And the reason I decided to call it non-sleep deep rest, NSDR, was not to rob it of the official name of Yoga Nidra, but because unfortunately, unfortunately, names like Yoga Nidra or proprietary names or thing, when we name protocols after people, it acts as a separator often deters people from trying things because it sounds esoteric. So I went with a description of the thing that relates to what the thing is supposed to do, non-sleep deep rest or what it's all about. So, um, you know, I actively avoided calling it Huberman breathing um, or something like that because that's not my interest. My interest is in people using these tools and I have taken some heat for that one. Um, I'm not interested in, it was not an attempt to appropriate something. It was really an attempt to just try and distribute valuable tools because I see a lot of suffering and it seems like a useful thing to do. So I would encourage anyone that feels like they enter a stressed state too much to learn self-directed relaxation. First and foremost, so do NSDR anywhere from three to five times a week, 10 minutes a day as a zero cost tool, as a way to be able to better access, better sleep at night. And then if the fight or flight state persists, then of course, things like physiological size, et cetera, um, should be incorporated. And then, of course, of course, of course, I believe in modern medicine, there are excellent pharmaceutical tools, prescription drugs that can be used for that. But of course, there's the intermediate stuff, things like theanine and magnesium that, you know, for all the world can be useful in some context, but they're not the be all end all. You know, I, I, as much as I might reference supplements on the podcast from time to time, I don't think they're the place to start. I think one should always use behavioral tools first. And I've said this many times before, um, but I'll, I think it's worth saying again. Our muscles need rest days from the gym in order to grow back stronger. Yes, definitely true. Um, is the brain designed to be consistently learning and developing, or does, does it need periods of rest from consuming new information? Or is the rest when we sleep? Great questions. Thank you, Timothy. Um, yes, indeed, our muscles get stronger, grow after a proper stimulus is applied to them in the time after we provide that stimulus, which typically is resistance. But since not everyone's interested in that, it's also the case that an endurance adaptation occurs after we embark on the run, the hike, the swim, et cetera. There's something kind of interesting, and I just want to take a moment and just um, mention that there's something kind of interesting about resistance training is that's the one form of training that because of the enhanced blood flow to the muscles while we do it, gives us a window into what the adaptation might look like once it occurs, if we allow proper rest. Whereas with endurance training, it's very different, right? You go further and, or you run up a hill until your legs burn and you want to vomit up a lung. And then the next time you do it, you don't feel quite as bad, right? The adaptation occurs, of course, in a very similar way to resistance training, different mechanisms, but there's a delay in adaptation and you get better. It's just that re with resistance training, you can kind of sense the change before the change occurs because of the enhanced blood flow of the muscles with endurance training, you sense the limit of your ability and then you exceed that limit subsequently. Now in terms of cognitive learning, the same thing is basically true. If you wanna get really technical about it, the computational biology, the modeling of this says that if you wanna learn something, probably setting the difficulty of what you're trying to learn to about 85% correct trials, 15% error trials, is probably ideal. What does that mean? It means if you're trying to learn a new piano piece, you know, or you're trying to teach that to a child, if they're not starting from scratch, let them play something that they know pretty well and then introduce a small percentage, maybe 10 to 15, maybe 20%, you don't have to be exact about this, of novel material that's hard for them to learn. But yes, it is the focused, deliberate attempt to learn something that creates that sense of underlying agitation that is the trigger, the stimulus for neuroplasticity. This makes sense. If you could complete something, if you could do something, a scale on, of music, a physical task, speaking a new language, if you could do that, 
why would your nervous system ever change? And how does your nervous system know if it's supposed to change, right? Your nervous system doesn't know successful trial versus failure trial, right? I've tried many times to learn other languages and I'm you know, modestly terrible at Spanish, but if I were to try and get better, my nervous system doesn't know when I'm failing. It has no idea. What it knows is the release of certain neuromodulators, namely adrenaline and norepinephrine, and a few others as well, that are associated with the underlying agitation of like, oh, I'm failing at this, I'm not able to remember that Spanish class because I didn't attend in high school, and this is really difficult. And that agitation, the frustration is the stimulus, but when we say frustration, it's the neurochemicals that when they bathe the surrounding neurons, those neurons go, oh, something needs to change for next time. And lo and behold, the stimulus for neuroplasticity has occurred. But the actual rewiring of the neurons, either the improvement or the reduction in the strength of synapses, of connections between neurons, and in rare instances, the addition of new neurons for neuroplasticity occurs, yes, when we sleep in states of deep rest or non-sleep deep rest, although there's less data to support that, but the actual rewiring occurs away from the stimulus. So there's really two important principles here. One is that agitation and stress and the neurochemicals that underlie agitation and stress, that is the stimulus for learning. And goodness, do I wish they had taught me that in school. I mean, they taught me all sorts of things in school, but they didn't teach me that. They didn't teach me the physiological side. Lord knows I would have done better in life if I had a couple of those tools. Instead, they told me, look, you know, if you drive drunk, you could die. That was good information. But they didn't tell us about all the other stuff. So I wish they told us about the stimulus and rest thing and somehow they have permission to talk about the rest. All right, what's my take on hallucinogens? <laughs> Goodness gracious. My take on hallucinogens is um, I've taken them, um, clearly. Um, well, here's the, the real story on hallucinogens. First of all, um, I'm, I'm very open about most everything I've done, you know, um, try and keep context appropriate, but... Um, I had the unfortunate experience of taking LSD and psilocybin when I was all too young, and those were bad experiences. Some of them were bad in the moment, some of them were bad after the moment. It is something I do not recommend, and I'm not saying that to be politically correct. I'm not saying that because it's true. The reality is that being a child, an adolescent, or a teenager is a psychedelic experience. And your brain is still wiring up in all sorts of interesting ways and everything seems chaotic. And even if you're one of those rare kids that seems to have everything rode up appropriately, you don't want to throw massive amounts of neuromodulators in there haphazardly and start tampering with the wiring. That's my deep belief, okay? You can, that's my deep belief. However, it does appear that at least for adults who are not suffering from particular psychiatric challenges, namely forms of psychosis, right? This is real. I mean, one in 100 people experiences schizophrenic symptoms, et cetera. It's a very high number if you think about it. Um, certain forms of bipolar depression that the clinical trials on psychedelics, and here I'm assuming when you say hallucinogens, you're referring to psychedelics, are very, very compelling. The psychiatric community is now being forced to look at these data because the data are very compelling. What do we know about these data? And yes, I've participated in two such clinical trials, one on high-dose psilocybin, high-dose meaning more than two grams, taken twice. By the way, this is with the support of medically trained therapists and the use of psychedelics such as psilocybin mostly psilocybin, not so much LSD. Do you know why most of the trials are on psilocybin and not LSD? I do, but I'm curious if, you know, it's not to, what's that? LSD's too long, that's right. That people need to go home. People need to go home, the technicians need to go, and LSD is a long ride. <laughs> it's a long ride. So the, the thing about psilocybin is that the, you know, the, the sort of journey, the trip is, you know, somewhere on the order of anywhere from, you know, three to seven hours, which can w fit into a reasonable workday for a technician clinician. Um, and LSD can be many, many hours longer. The kind of um, Mount Everest of psychedelics, which is under investigation by a colleague of mine at Stanford School of Medicine, Nolan Williams, is Ibogaine, Iboga, 
which is 22 hours long. It has cardiac effects. This is not something to, to get cavalier with. This is something only to be done in a clinical context with medical experts there. And Iboga is very interesting. From what I'm told, I have not participated in an Iboga trial. Iboga allows for or induces a state in which you do not hallucinate at all with eyes open, but the moment you go eyes closed, you get a high-resolution, accurate picture of prior events in your life, but you have agency, you have volition inside of those pictures, and you're able to change your behavior and re-sculpt your relationship to those experiences. Like, wow. And the state of Kentucky in California recently, uh, excuse me, the state of Kentucky in the United States, and thank goodness Kentucky isn't inside of California, that would be civil war. <laughs> the state of Kentucky recently took the $40 million settlement from the opioid thing, right? You've all heard about that, the opioid crisis, and applied that money to Iboga trials. So there, this stuff is happening. This stuff is really happening now in the U.S. In any event, psilocybin, these two sessions, medically supported two sessions, um, has been shown to be pretty effective in the treatment of major depression. Um, not completely effective. Sometimes there's adverse outcomes, but far more effective than the other pharmaceutical treatments that it's been compared to. So that's interesting. And psilocybin is serotonin. If you look at the structure of psilocybin, it looks like serotonin. So what we're talking about is a massive dose of serotonin. And psilocybin appears to bind near selectively to a particular serotonin receptor. And the outcome seems to be enhanced or more, more broad connectivity between brain areas that normally are not communicating with one another. Probably not the growth of new connections, but the, let's say, the unveiling of the ability for certain brain areas to communicate with one another, whereas they couldn't prior. Different ways of thinking about the same problems, which is logically sound if you think about ways to deal with depression. Depression is characterized by a number of things, of course, but one of the hallmark features of depression, in addition to sleep challenges, is a lack of positive anticipation of the future. And it does seem that these macrodose psilocybin trials are helpful for that. Turns out that the microdosing of psilocybin has not been shown to be terribly effective, which is not to say it isn't, but the trials don't support that, although there aren't many trials of that yet. So it appears, you know, if you had to pick between micro and macro dosing, go macro. Um, but be careful. Um, go be careful and, and set in setting is important. Safety is important and certainly not for children. And as long as, and, or adolescents or teenagers, I really, again, want to want to reemphasize that. The, the other thing is, as long as we're talking about psychedelics and hallucinogens, we should probably just touch on MDMA for a moment. First of all, MDMA ecstasy um, has a number of challenges or p potential problems that need to be highlighted. First of all, um, contaminants. You know, we have a fentanyl crisis in the U.S., so contaminants, so purity is essential. Second of all, it is methylene dioxy methamphetamine. And the methamphetamine part often gets people thinking like, whoa. It seems, however, that the inclusion of the methylene dioxy component increases serotonin dramatically, and it is the increase in serotonin, perhaps, or at least it's now thought, in addition to the increase in dopamine caused by the methamphetamine component combined that provides some sort of neuroprotective effect. The early reports that MDMA ecstasy is neurotoxic, quote unquote, puts holes in your brain, was flawed by, and indeed that paper was retracted. The researchers did that study in earnest, but then later discovered that when they reached for the MDMA on the shelf, they actually grabbed the methamphetamine but the news agencies didn't report that retraction. Now, our best evidence that MDMA taken in the appropriate clinically supported context can act as an empathogen, can help people develop empathy for themselves and help relieve trauma. And indeed, the clinical trials show that at the proper dosing and the proper frequency with the proper support, there's up to 60% and as high as 67% remission of PTSD. Remarkable with support, okay, not just taking Molly and like dancing in the desert. We're talking about 
We're talking about in the eye mask. We're talking about going inward. We're talking about relaying your experience. We're talking about talking about the challenging experience or experiences with someone who's qualified to help you deal with all of that, et cetera, and someone to drive you home because you feel like a puddle afterwards. Talking about all of that. We're not talking about eye gazing with your partner, telling them how much you love them. You're talking about empathy for self, love for self, which is a concept that, frankly, I've often struggled with. I've thought, you know, people would say, you got to love yourself. I'm like, what is that? Like, what is that? I love my bulldog. I love my friends. I love cuttlefish. But, like, what is that? And I think through the use of MDMA, you can, there seems to be this ability to develop empathogenic states to yourself. But, of course, the reason for the clinical trials insisting that people stay in the eye mask and communicate their experience, maybe popping out of it every once in a while and talking with somebody in a trusted, sort, a trusted person in a way that can be helpful towards dealing with the trauma is that the problem with having that much serotonin and that much dopamine in your system is that you can become empathic toward anything. So we've all known people that take MDMA, listen to a particular soundtrack, and they're like, I'm gonna become a musician. I love music. And again, I'm not recommending anyone do MDMA, but in recent years, I've really changed my stance on psychedelics. Five years ago, 10 years ago, I never would have had this discussion, certainly not with a microphone in front of my face, anything being recorded. Would have worried about losing my job at Stanford or elsewhere. But we now have many laboratories at Stanford and elsewhere that are doing work that is federally funded on these compounds. And if you think about these compounds, while they have been used recreationally, are simply ways to adjust levels of neuromodulators in the brain, serotonin, dopamine, et cetera. That's really all they are, although they do it very potently and therefore caution needs to be applied. And as long as we're on that topic, I should mention that ketamine, everyone's excited about ketamine. When I was growing up, I was taught that there's a compound that's really dangerous. It's called PCP, fencyclidine. They are the same compound. They don't tell you this. Ketamine and PCP, same thing. And I learned about PCP as the compound that was going to make criminals like punch light poles and beat up 12 cops. And yeah, I watched too much Chips when I was growing up. For those of you old, old enough to remember, it was like Ponch and John. They were on the motorcycles with the shorts. My sister watched it too, but for completely different reasons. So PCP was like this d demonized drug. But ketamine and all this stuff about ketamine is now legal in the US. I don't know its status here in Sydney, so I'll see if I get arrested on the way out. But, you know, ketamine is potentially addictive. Um, people talk about the K-hole, et cetera. Weird name, by the way. Um, the whole business with ketamine is, again, it's a potent MDMA, N-methyl diaspartate blocker, which blocks neuroplasticity in the short term, expands it in the long term. So the way to think about these compounds, these drugs, is by way of their mechanism. And so it should be no surprise that they're able to induce neuroplasticity, but the goal is not plasticity. This is very, very important. The goal is not plasticity. The goal is plasticity directed toward a particular positive outcome. Anytime you have plasticity, you have the potential for maladaptive plasticity as well. And so that's an additional cautionary note. As I often say on the podcast, I don't say that just to protect me, although I am a little bit worried now about what I just said over the last five minutes. I say that to protect you. Next question before I get myself in trouble. What about what? DMT. Yeah, dimethyltryptamine. The, yeah, it leads to less imp uh, to um, lower thresholds for impulsivity, like screaming out, what about DMT? Just kidding. I don't, <laughs> sorry. Um, so I'm just joking. I'm just joking. You seem like you could take it. So I, I yeah. So, um, so I've never done DMT, but I've heard it's a high speed freight train into your consciousness behind the circuit board and back again. Um, so there are a few great studies on DMT and ayahuasca, just as long as we're expanding into the, the full trip down to the jungle. Um, and the, the data are interesting. It's, it's harder to know what's going on in these very short trip, massive neuromodulator release um, uh, type drug scenarios. Um, Robin Cardart Harris at the University of California, San Francisco is somebody who's looking at DMT um, more extensively. And, and I I don't want to avoid giving you an answer, but I, I do want to avoid giving you a, a wrong answer that's not informed. One thing I'll say, and this is just 
Uh, rarely do I plug anything related to the podcast, but we're, we are actually providing some support to Robin and others' laboratory for the study of things like DMT. One of the things that we do at the podcast, and this is not a request for anything, we do take a significant portion of the proceeds from our premium channel, and we fund human studies of exciting things like DMT. We're supporting Robin's lab this coming year. I've pulled together some other donors to provide support for all human studies, no animal studies. And the goal is really to fill in important blanks like the study of DMT, um, as well as other things. We're, we're currently funding the um, Eating Disorders Laboratory at, the, at Columbia University. Eating disorders, by the way, um, anorexia nervosa in particular, the most deadly of all psychiatric disorders, a uh, really um, tragic challenge there. Um, so I just mentioned that getting funding for science on really um, kind of next level stuff is hard for reasons that are, would take up the whole night. So that's one thing that I'm really trying to do in the next few years. And again, this is not a request, but to you know pool together donors and get them to give money to laboratories to do the kind of stuff that's going to feed back to the general public very quickly. Because I think we're all getting a little tired of the like, okay, mouse study, which are great, you know, but in 10 years, this might lead to a blank for Alzheimer's or blank for autism. I think we're all getting a little tired of that narrative. So we're trying to accelerate the process. Okay. The, yeah, thank you. The, um, and it's not a sole effort. It's just, I do happen to know a lot about the way that funding me mechanisms can get a little bit clogged. And so just trying to, you know, clear some of those clogs. Um, the brain and gut axis, is this a thing? It is most definitely a thing. So I think one of the more exciting areas is the so-called gut-brain axis. We all now hear about the gut microbiome. I must say, down here, y'all are really evolved in this dimension. The other day I noticed, probably from jet lag and travel and I don't know, maybe I swam in some stuff that had too much chlorine or something. I was getting like some little like skin thing on my face. I was like, all right, I'll go, go get some triple antibiotic ointment like I do back home, clean it up because I forgot mine. So I go to the pharmacy here, what you call the chemist. I go to the pharmacy and, and the guy behind the counter says, well, you don't, first of all, you can't get triple antibiotic ointment here. You need a prescription. I'm like, all right. Well, this is going to get tricky. Now i got to forge a prescription. And, and I'm just kidding. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, and he says, but, you know, have you considered whether or not maybe your skin microbiome is struggling because of the lack of sleep, the jet lag, and maybe you were exposed to some chlorine or something? I thought, you know, that's a logical way to think about it. Because we just did an episode on oral health where I'm telling everybody, hey, like avoid these like high alcohol astringent mouthwashes that kill your oral microbiome because all the dentists and periodontists are telling me, yeah, they'll make your breath fresh, but actually it's wrecking your gut microbiome and it's bad for, but so I take the probiotic. You guys have amazing probiotics here. And in a day, boom, it's done. Now, I didn't do a controlled clinical trial. I don't know whether or not that was really what did it, but it's an interesting idea. This I We know, for instance, that we have a distinct microbiome niches, different bacteria that live in our nasal passages, on the surface of our eyes, on the surface of our skin, in the urethra, in essentially every orifice, mucous membrane, but everywhere in and around our body. And that these little microbiota are provided they are supported, they do many things, but among them, the gut microbiome, which of course starts in the mouth, as the oral health episode um, describes, with a lot of protocols as well, the gut microbiome, when it's well supported, creates certain fatty acids that are the precursors or catalysts for the production of certain neurotransmitters in the brain. And it is now oh so clear that enhancing the diversity of flora, of microbiota in the gut and mouth is great for the nervous system. So much so that some of the studies on relief from certain neuropsychiatric conditions are being achieved through, and I know it's not pleasant, but microbiota transfer between individuals, so-called fecal transplants, which always makes me a little bit uncomfortable to think about, never had one. But, you know, it's pretty interesting, you know, despite the discomfort of thinking about that process, at least for me, the... The whole business of taking the gut microbiota from one individual that's not suffering from something and putting it into another individual and seeing relief from certain symptoms of given conditions is really compelling. So I think that we should all be thinking about ways to support our gut-brain axis. It's very clear that the best 
low cost, no supplement way to do that is going to be to consume one to four servings of some fermented food. No, beer doesn't count. Low sugar fermented foods, I suppose beer does count, but it comes with some other issues, um, such as, you know, kimchi or sauerkrauts or kefirs or, you know, every culture seems to have its own uh, probiotic, prebiotic foods, and that's going to be the best way. And it's clear that it has immense benefit. And then when you don't have access to those foods, doing things like taking a pill probiotic now and again is probably not a bad idea if you're traveling or you're sleep deprived. The, the, the challenge with that sort of thing is that it's a generalized effect of supporting multiple systems in the brain and body. So it's going to be a long time, maybe never, before you see a really nice clean study that says that, okay, increasing the amount of lactobacillus in the gut by taking you know X number of milligrams of lactobacillus improves your cognition. You're not going to find that study. Why? Because in science, it's important, and in health, to distinguish between moderating effects and mediating effects. Lots of things can moderate a given feature of your brain or health. So, for instance, if, uh, you know, God forbid, a fire alarm went off tonight, it would moderate our tension, or excuse me, modulate, modulate, Kentucky's in California, and now I'm saying moderate, modulate your attention, but it doesn't mediate attention. On a normal basis, you know, the fire alarm isn't involved in your attention, whereas certain other things mediate those mechanisms of attention. So when you improve sleep, you're going to see positive effects on any number of things. When you sleep deprive people, you're going to see deficits in any number of things. These are not direct effects, these are indirect effects. Likewise with the microbiome. So I think gut microbiome sits in the various, what I call pillars of mental health, physical health, and performance. These are the things that we should try and tend to on a regular basis to give buoyancy to our mental health, physical health, and performance. But I wouldn't get too caught up in wondering which exact microbiota are important. I think diversity of the microbiome is key. If you're taking antibiotics, you want to do something to counter that through pill probiotics, et cetera. And certainly antibiotics aren't bad, but the overuse of antibiotics um, certainly can be. And um, good on you for having uh, chemists that know better than to just hand me a bottle 